Hello everyone. In this presentation, God's plan for Israel and God's plan for today, I want to look at what God really wanted when he called Israel out of Egypt. What kind of nation did he want them to become? What was his plan? This is not just about ancient Israel, it's about us today, what God wants to achieve in our own lifetime today. And it's the same what God wanted right throughout history. So we'll look at uh, some Le Leviticus 18 now to get some idea. In Leviticus 18, 1 to 5, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord, your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. What was it that was so bad about the Canaanites? What were these practices? What was it so bad? What evil was it that the Canaanites were doing that God really sternly warned them? Well, we'll look now at Leviticus, some passages from there where various relationships that God warned them against uh, practicing. Leviticus 18, verse 6. No one is to approach any relative, any close relative, to have sexual relations. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. Do not have sexual relations with your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter of your father's wife. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister. Do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. And do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. And do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch. Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. No same-sex relations. Do not have sexual relations with an animal. And at the end, God warned, if you commit any of these acts, the lamb will vomit you out. We can see from this, all these various relationships, that the only uh, relations permitted, the only sexual relations permitted by those, by God, are those between a husband and a wife. Historian John Bright, in the History of Israel, on page 116 117, he points out, he explains what the nature of these religions that Canaanites practiced. And he points out, an extraordinary debasing form of paganism, numerous debasing practices, including sacred prostitution, homosexuality, and various orgiastic rites were prevalent. Also, Werner Keller, an archaeologist, who also wrote a book called The, uh, the Bible as History, in page 266, he points out that uh, men and women, prostitutes, ranked as sacred to the followers of the religion. So he points out that actually the male and female prostitutes were like saints, and part of their religious rites were having relationships with these. This is the kind of religion that they practiced in Canaan. We look now at the Bible passage, a few Bible passages, and we find out that actually the Israelites, despite God's warning, they did practice some of these uh, rites, sexual practices from this cult, as we see in 1 Kings 14, 22-24. Judah, yes, of the Lord, by the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than their fathers had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones, and Asherah poles on every high hill, and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations 
the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So the goddess Asherah, they did involve in these this sexual cult, and we can see in these images now that were discovered what they were. What were these Asherah poles? Through sexual images. Deuteronomy 23, 17, 18. No Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. You must not bring the earnings of a female prostitute or of a male prostitute into the house of the Lord your God to pay any vow, because the Lord your God detests them both. And Ezekiel points out that actually uh, they did offer their children to Moloch or the idols. It was warned in, as we saw in Luke, uh, Leviticus 18. And you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to the idols. Was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. And Werner Keller, he states also that without God's stern warning and the prophets who warned them, it would have been very difficult for the Israelites to actually uh, survive this sexualized culture of the Canaanites. So we can understand from this why there's so many warnings, why the prophets had an incredible task. Otherwise it would have been swamped by the sexual, sexualized culture of the time, like other nations were. We look now at God's uh, providence. The history of God's providence has taken so long because central persons often failed through sexual temptations. And we can see this from the first uh, human beings, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, the first human beings, we can see they fell through sexual temptation. We can see before the fall, we see in Genesis 2.25, they were naked and had no shame. But then a few passages after, in Genesis 3.7, they were naked and they became ashamed of their nakedness. So it's human nature to feel guilty from the sexual part, for, from the part they uh, committed the crime. That Adam and Eve covered their sexual parts because they were guilty from them. Adam and Eve felt guilt through their sexual organs because they sinned through them. Now we grow spiritually through God's love. The misuse of love brings about our own self-destruction and results in the breakdown of the family. If Adam and Eve obeyed God, they would have grown, matured in God's love, and they would have been the beginning of many other couples, many other families. The first, as a first couple, they would have probably guided their couples after them how to become ideal couples. And they would have grown in their ability to love each other and love their children. But they failed, and, and they failed to love their children. And we can see this when Cain killed his brother. Hatred, so whatever is a vacuum of love. Hatred always comes, and after hatred comes violence, and then Cain murdered his brother. We see this same thing right throughout history. Mostly a lack of love in families, and violence, hatred and violence. When God wanted to a, a, a kingdom, he called David. Now David was a, had a beautiful character. He was a humble person. He sacrificed himself when he stood up to Goliath where everyone else was afraid to and he took him on. Later on when King Saul tried to kill him when David had a chance to, to kill him he would not do it because King Saul was Saul's uh, God's anointed. You see such a wonderful character he had but through his lustful desire for Bathsheba he did a terrible thing. His lustful desire caused him to send Uriah, one of his generals, deliberately in the front line of battle, knowing he would get killed so he could take his wife, which he did. And we can see that this fallen love really ruined his character. True love builds our character, but fallen love 
brings our own self-destruction, destroys our character. And we see this in David, and we see this in many other people since that point, unfortunately. So in 2 Samuel 11, 2-17, despite the good qualities David had, through his lust, he did the most despicable acts, such as sending Uriah deliberately to die. So David commits adultery with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Later, King Solomon became king. Now, Solomon is famous for his wisdom, but he's also famous for his uh, lust, unfortunately. We see in 1 Kings 11, verse 1 to 2, it explains that King Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He also worshipped their gods, such as Ashtoreth and Moloch. And Moloch, is, if you recall, in Leviticus 18, the people were offering their sons to Moloch. So Solomon definitely fell through lust and destroyed his character. So although he, he did build the temple, but he defiled it through his, all his wives and his sexual sins that he committed in there. Reverend Samyam Moon states in the uh, Exposition of the Divine Principle, page 61, Sexual promiscuity is a principal cause of the downfall of numerous heroes, patriots and nations. Even in the most outstanding people, the root of sin, illicit sexual desire, is constant, constantly active in their souls, sometimes without their conscious awareness. And the Bible gives various warnings throughout against their sexual sins, such as Proverbs 6, 32-33. But a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot and his shame will never be wiped away. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul warns against sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6.18. He states, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Now Paul is writing to the uh, Corinthians, this is a Christian community at that time, there, but in Corinth, it's famous for its uh, immorality, and we find historical records. In Corinth, there were there was a temple dedicated to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and sex, which had one thousand prostitute priestesses. So this is the state of the world at that time. So in Paul's time, or all the ancient world probably, it's not much different from Canaan. It's full of it's a sexualized culture. So you see from these images, Aphrodite was the Greek god, goddess of love and sex. Venus was a goddess of love and sex, a Roman goddess. Now Pompeii, we can learn a lot from Pompeii. Pompeii was a, a city was destroyed by a volcano, but many of his artwork, a lot of his artwork, are discovered. And we can see from his artwork that, again, it was full of sexualized images. It shows that there's the state, because they worship the god, goddess Venus. Now, Christianity, Augustine, Augustine is often considered the, the greatest of the theologians. But he, he states, he, but he uh, did not understand the three blessings that God gave to Adam and Eve. He did not understand clearly the purpose of creation. Augustine knew to some extent that the four were sexual, but the problem was that he did not know God's purpose in the three blessings, Genesis 1.28. So in time, celibacy was promoted. Which avoided husband-wife relations altogether. Husband-wife relations are very important. Through this we grow. Because in a, in a family, it's husband-wife relationship, it's father-son relationship, mother-son, mother-daughter. All these relationships are very important. And celibacy doesn't uh, avoid this. Marriage is a, a challenge for us to grow, to find our other half, 
we grow toward God. But when we avoid this, we avoid all these opportunities for growth. And uh, he did not understand that this is really God's purpose. And celibacy itself was not as successful. Many people could not keep it. And many of the clergy that we know, even even in our time today, have commit sexual sins despite being celibate. Peter de Rosa states in his book uh, Vicars of Christ, now he states that the, the leadership of the church often committed sexual sins despite being celibate. Even the popes, Christian leaders from all persuasions committed sexual sins. And he states in uh, page 130 that the Council of Constance in 1414 to 1418, there were over 1,200 prostitutes working around the clock as they found that the clergy paid keener prices for their services than the military. So very clearly, these, are the, these clergy, these are religious representatives of this council, did not consider sexual sin as a serious. Now today's Christianity, today's Christianity has been teaching the forgiveness of sins by Jesus, but has not been able to guide people into overcoming sexual sins. This is seen in the fact that many of the clergy and other Christian leaders have been convicted of sexual crimes. So Christianity emphasizes the forgiveness, Jesus' forgiveness of all sins. But the, but the problem with this is that all sins tend to be considered the same. Jesus forgives all sins, so they don't worry about individual sins, is that tendency. But are all sins the same? Well, clearly not. Because if you think of uh, injuries, are all injuries the same? No, they cannot be, it's obviously not. If I break my neck, it's much more serious than cutting a finger, cutting my finger. And so sexual sin is much more serious than telling a lie. Many sins can be solved that sexual sins are very difficult to solve. And I feel the problem with Christianity is overemphasis in Jesus forgiving sins, but they tend to be not taken so seriously, particularly sexual sins, which are, the church has not been clearly been able to solve. Reverend Somyam Moon states, as true love is most precious, violating it is a universal crime. Immorality, juvenile promiscuity, family breakdown, incest, homosexuality, indescribable sex crimes, and so on, are the reality of today. These cause God grief. The ideal of creation lies in the fulfillment of the family ideal, which is based on sublime and eternal love. But why did it result in today's miserable way? We can say that in the last days, the result of the fall of the first ancestors is bearing fruit in displays of decadence, just like the seeds that were sown. So therefore, because of the inability of the uh, Christian leadership in the world to guide people into a, a higher way of life, purer way of life, centered on Christian uh, family ideals, we have a today's sexualized society, which is little difference than the ancient uh, culture, ancient sexualized culture in the ancient world, which always led to destruction, self-destruction. So what is God's ideal? We can read in Romans 1, 19 to 21. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so, they are, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So in this, Paul is stating clear that God is invisible. So God's invisible nature can be clearly seen in the things he made, his creation. 
So in the creation, which is visible, the effect, it reflects God's invisible nature being the cause. This is similar to the relationship between the mind and the body of a person. The body is a visible effect. The mind is the invisible cause. That's why psychologists, they study a person's behaviour. They study what they see to understand what they cannot see. The person's thinking. Well, if you study an artist, his works, you can understand something about his, his mind. So in the same way, if we study God's creation, we should understand something about God. So let's look at nature. In God's creation, we find that everything exists in internal and external, that duality, and also everything's masculine and feminine. For example, internal and external, human mind and body. Internal mind, external body. And men and women, as masculine and feminine animals and so forth. This tells us that God must be the same. He must have an internal and external aspect, but he also must be masculine and feminine. But if you think of it, half of God's creation is masculine, masculine but half is feminine. It says clear, like Genesis 1.27 states, that the image of God is male and female. So in history, only the masculinity has been emphasized mostly, especially in Christianity. But we can see many uh, spiritually attuned people. We find even in the Old Testament, the, the idea of wisdom is a motherly aspect of God, a feminine aspect. Or well, many people uh, today, many spiritually attuned people, uh, sense that the Holy Spirit is more the motherly aspect of God. So the purpose, we can see all these things exist in relationships. So what is the, the purpose of life? is the three blessings recorded in Genesis 1.28. So we'll look at this more closely. The first blessing is the unity between the mind and the body, centered on God. This means that usually a person is not very mature, he's dominated by the passions of his body, and his mind becomes a slave to his passions. But in this sense, the mind should direct the body, we decide and control a body. In this way you can find peace and harmony. If we unite our mind and body, we can become one with God through our relationship with God. And we can become, as Jesus pointed out when he stated in the future, in John 14, 20, that you also will be one with God. Jesus often said he and his father are one, but he said you also will be one with God because that's, that is our purpose. First Corinthians three sixteen, Paul states, do you not know you are God's temple, that God's Spirit dwells in you? We're supposed to be God's temple, again, being one with God. And in Matthew 5.48, Jesus states, You must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Again, our nature should be like God's if we're one with God. So the first blessing means, simply put, our individual perfection. So the second blessing comes based on that. It means a perfect man and a perfect woman coming together to unite husband and wife, become one with God, resembling God's masculine and feminine nature, as Genesis 1, 27. Then, the third blessing means uh, in relationship to the creation, to unite with creation and become one with God, as Romans 8, 19 and 23 states, we should love the creation which have his ideal relationship with the creation, centre on God. So God is one God, but also God is heavenly parent and has fatherly and motherly characteristics. So this is a very important point, because often we refer to God as our heavenly father, but he's our heavenly parent. So therefore, if we look more closely at the uh, second blessing, a man represents only the masculinity of God. A woman represents only the femininity of God. So it's only when they're together can we find a wholesome. We're, we're only half to that point. So the basic unit of society is not the individual, but a husband and wife together, which forms a family. 
An individual is a half expression of God. So a husband and wife together can form the image of God. Genesis 1.27 This is why the scriptures condemn other relations such as same-sex marriages. We can see, you know, often uh, in everyday speech, we say my other half, where a person speaks about their spouse. Because, and often we, people feel we're not complete unless I find my other half. So I'm not complete until I find my wife. And uh, a woman is not complete until she finds her, her husband. Because masculinity and femininity together form the image of God. And that's why in Genesis 2.24 it states, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And later Jesus quoted Genesis. He said in Matthew 19.4-6, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. If there are no fall of Adam and Eve, then Adam and Eve would have become the mature parents, true parents, and they would have guided their children in themselves becoming ideal parents, and their grandparents, and so on. And all the parents would realize ideal families. In such a world, relationships, families of true love would be merged. This would be a beautiful one family world. This is what God planned at the very beginning. But uh, for this reason, this is why Reverend and Mrs. Moon have been performing blessed marriages throughout the world, marrying people from all over, all over the world to return to the God-centered marriage. And in this, in due course, will bring salvation to the world. So this is a wonderful news. We've had marriages, it's true, but they've not been largely, largely unsuccessful, reaching levels of one in three marriages and in divorce within three years. And then two out of three and in divorce within 10 years, in many cases. So marriages have not been successful we may have been successful as individuals in our academics or business and so on, but the real, our real lives live in our hearts, what kind of love relationships we have. And this is where we need real salvation, must come from real, true love in our lives. So marriage is a very central part. And it's for this reason that Reverend and Mrs. Moon spend their entire lives work, working on this area. We've seen that actually um, in the very beginning, when the first couple, Adam and Eve, they failed to mature. In this case, they failed to realize an ideal family. So there was a, a lack of love there. And when there's a vacuum of love, hatred usually ensues. And then in that first family, hatred resulted in murder, and Cain, Cain murdered his brother. So we've seen this right throughout history, history of violence, and wars and violence, the same pattern right throughout history. Only true love can save this world. So we need to change, we need to save the family. The smallest, the basic unit of society is not the individual, but it's the family. Family is the basic unit of, of, of the world. So unless we can save the family, we cannot save the world. We've seen that uh, fallen love This brings destruction. True love builds up, builds up character, builds up an ideal. True love, there's no limit where it can go. It brings life. But fallen love brings death, destruction. It destroys a person's character, and it de destroys a person's heart. So we need to return to true love. In family relations, we learn how to love, fulfill all the relationship between husband and wife, between father and son, father and daughter, mother, son, mother, daughter. This is the hope. Brother and Mrs. Moon worked their entire lives to bring about this understanding. True love is what brings salvation. 
The Bible says unless we understand love, we cannot understand God, because God is love. As the Apostle John said in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. So this is true, just as true today as ever. So I thank you for your attention in watching this video. And I urge you to take time to study Reverend Moon's words in exposition of divine principle or attend a seminar. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.